Bill Briggs is Professor Emeritus, Mathematics, CU Denver. Born in Boulder, he spent 10 years enhancing his education and teaching on the East Coast. Wisely, he returned to Boulder as this area better caters to some of his passions, hiking, rock climbing, mountain climbing, trail running, and oh yes, his devotion to baking bread. Twice he ran the Pikes Peak Marathon, that run being rather short, he also twice ran the Leadville 100, and for those of you not familiar, that's miles, not kilometers. He is the author or co-author of several textbooks. One has the intriguing title, Ants, Bikes, and Clocks, Math Problem Solving for Undergraduates. Early in his career, Bill enjoyed a Fulbright Fellowship to Ireland, where he taught, did research, and was an avid tourist with his family. Currently, Bill is a member of the Chautauqua Board, where he serves as treasurer. The subject of guns in America has intrigued Bill for many years. His research led him to write a book, the subject of today's presentation, How America Got Its Guns. Please welcome Bill. All right, I think I'm all plugged in and turned on here. <clears throat> First, uh, thanks to TK for arranging this appearance. Uh, it happened on short notice, but that was fine with me. Uh, thank you to the Rotary Club for the invitation. And I guess most of all, thanks to all of you for coming, because I realize you could easily be outdoors in the sunshine playing golf or sailing or doing something other than listening to me. So thank you for being here. Um, I have a long story to tell and not very much time in which to tell it. So I'll get right to it. I'd like to start with a few facts that I think we might all agree on. Uh, for several decades, and certainly at the present, the United States is in the middle of what we could call a crisis or an epidemic of gun violence. Uh, second, it's a very complicated issue. You can't really understand guns in America without looking at legal, political, historical, psychological, and certainly emotional issues. And that's what makes this uh, issue so very complicated. And because it's so complicated, there are no easy solutions. If someone tells you they know how to solve gun violence in this country, you might exercise a little bit of skepticism. So uh, maybe we can all agree on that. And now I'd like to try to tell you why this is such a complicated issue. And um, I'm going to start with just some facts. Now, the numbers around guns are notoriously unreliable. Um, many of the numbers come from polls. And polls have deficiencies, as you probably know. And yet people have been collecting data on guns for many decades, and so you can start to see some trends. So here are a couple of facts. Uh, every year, there are approximately 33,000 deaths due to guns, and that's converging very quickly with the number of traffic deaths in this country. So one number has been going up for several decades, gun deaths. The other number, traffic deaths, has been going down, and they're about to converge. Now, according to polls, and again, you have to be a little careful about this, uh, at the moment, about 40% of households uh, claim to have at least one gun. Now, that's a number that's actually gone down over the years. It used to be as high as 50%. If you survey for individual ownership, roughly 30% of adult Americans uh, claim to have or own at least one gun. Now, here's a very slippery number. <clears throat> How many guns are there in this country? Well, there are many estimates, but they seem to range between about 280 and 310 million guns. Now, if you figure that out, it's just slightly less than one gun per person. Now, that number is really hard to get a grasp on because unlike cars, we don't um, register guns, we don't license gun owners, 
guns are bought, sold, imported, exported, destroyed uh, in, in ways that nobody keeps track of. It's a highly unregulated industry. Um, another very important number for gun control and gun rights advocates is what's called DGUs, defensive gun uses. That's important because this number measures how many times in a year is a gun used to prevent or avert a crime. Now, if that number's high, then gun rights people have an argument to say, well, it's worth having a lot of people carrying guns in their back pocket because they can protect themselves. If that number is low, then the gun control people say, look, it's not worth it. No reason to have armed citizens on the street. So the problem is that number varies over an order of magnitude, anywhere from 80,000 of these DGUs to 2.5 million. I think another really telling uh, statistic is that polls ask <clears throat> respondents to list the top three reasons that they own a gun. 47% of people, and again, this is plus or minus, respond to that question saying they own a gun for self-defense. And I think that's a telling uh, statistic about um, where gun ownership is in this country. Now, having said that, I also think it's really important to realize that gun owners are not one homogeneous, monolithic uh, layer in our society. Gun owners come, and I'm sure I'm talking to many of them right now, are not just sort of the um, rampant NRA members that are contributing and um, promoting gun rights fanatically. There are gun owners who do uh, trap shooting, skeet shooting, practical shooting, cowboy um, reenactments. There's Olympic marksmen. Gun owners come in many different varieties, and it's really dangerous, I think, to um, try to stereotype gun owners, and um, that's an important thing to remember is the incredibly diverse culture among gun owners. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. That's the high altitude picture of gun ownership in the country. Um, now we get <clears throat> 250 years of US history in maybe about five minutes. I'm supposed to be watching this clock here. So you really have to go back to <clears throat> the uh, colonial days uh, when this country uh, was born to really understand the history of gun ownership and in particular the Second Amendment. So very quickly, um, in 1987, uh, the Constitutional Convention met. It took two years to produce the U.S. Constitution. The first thing to remember there is that this was an incredibly contentious, controversial, tumultuous, turbulent process. In other words, it was political. This was not a meeting of a bunch of Rotarians sitting down and talking to each other civilly. There were incredibly diverse opinions from the 13 colonies that went into the Constitutional Convention. They all had different ideas about what the country should look like, what the Constitution should look like. And one of the things that split um, the, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention was this distinction between Federalists, so this was Adams, Hamilton, Monroe, Madison, who favored a very strong central government. Sorry, for, oh no, that's okay. I thought there's a typo there. Who were opposed by the anti-federalists, who were very concerned about states' rights and individual rights, and they did not favor a strong central government. And so that that uh, separation ran all the way through the Constitutional Convention, and. It's surprising that up until the last minute in that convention, nobody thought about a Bill of Rights. And only in the last week or so did somebody put up their hand and say, well, wait, we can't have a Constitution unless we have a Bill of Rights. And <clears throat> the Anti-Federalists favored a, a Bill of Rights because they wanted to protect individual rights. The Federalists opposed the Bill of Rights. They thought that a strong central government could protect everybody. And you'll see that that plays out because the... Constitution was ratified without a Bill of Rights. 
promise, though, to get that constitution ratified among the states was that they, uh, the, the colonies would come back and at the first meeting of the Congress, they would start writing a Bill of Rights. And so the first Congress met in 1790, George Washington was inaugurated as president, and they immediately got down to writing a Bill of Rights. And again, this same distinction between Federalists and Anti-Federalists ran all the way through that discussion. The only thing that saved the entire process was James Madison. He started out as a Federalist, but he understood that if the Constitution was really going to come together, and if the Union was to be preserved, that there had to be a Bill of Rights. The states were asking for a Bill of Rights. Many of the states had their own constitutions, which had Bills of Rights. So it took two years, but in 1791, we came up with the Bill of Rights. That was, again, an incredibly contentious process. It started out with 400 amendments, and they slowly whittled them down um, over that two-year period. And again, Madison was sort of the shepherd through all of this. How many amendments do we have today in the Bill of Rights? 10. It went from 400 to 10. And as you know, one of those amendments um, is the Second Amendment, which uh, addresses the, the right to keep and bear arms. So I think the, first, the, the reason for all of that history is to point out that there was no one prevailing understanding about gun rights from the beginning. The delegates to these conventions were split from the start. They argued, they fought. There were different reasons to favor gun rights. There were different reasons to oppose gun rights. And so this is what I call the founder's fallacy. If someone says, well, obviously, we should have liberal gun, gun laws in this country because that's what the founding fathers intended, I suggest that you, again, take that argument with a bit of skepticism. And it works the same way. If the gun control people say, well, clearly, this was the intent of the Second Amendment. Well, that's probably not the case either. It's very difficult to make an argument in the entire gun control debate based on um, the intentions of the founders. Um, <clears throat> so one of the interesting questions that arose right from the start is, so now we have a Bill of Rights, 10 rights that are to be protected. But to what bodies, to what government bodies do those rights pertain? In other words, who cannot violate um, the First Amendment or the Second Amendment? Thank you. The understanding at that time was that those rights were protected by actions only by Congress. And you can see it in the First Amendment. Congress shall not pass a law which violates freedom of speech, assembly, and so forth. And it was held to be implicit in all of the other amendments as well. So when it comes to the Second Amendment, the understanding was Congress shall not pass a law that infringes the right to keep and bear arms, but the states are free to do whatever they want. And in fact, in the early days after the Constitutional Convention, there were plenty of states that had laws that in fact violated fundamental rights in the Bill of Rights. So that's an important thing to keep in mind is that originally the Second Amendment was intended to protect rights only from the actions of Congress. Over the next 200 years, a process took place called incorporation, by which various courts, often the Supreme Court, decided which of the rights in the Bill of Rights were actually protected by actions by the states. And so slowly you see many of the rights, like the First Amendment rights, the Fourth Amendment rights, being um, incorporated, which means the states also could not violate those rights. Second Amendment was just about the last amendment to be incorporated, and it didn't happen until this century. Okay, so what's the Second Amendment say? A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. Those commas are important because they weren't always there. There are earlier versions of the Bill of Rights that had one comma, two commas, three commas, and in fact, let me just, this was interesting, I just stumbled on this this morning. Um, if I don't get my glasses, I'm not going to read this to you. Here's an earlier version of the Bill of Rights. Um, 
one of many versions. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, semicolon. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, colon, but no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms should be compelled to render military service in person. Well, first, that's not even a complete sentence, but apart from that, <clears throat> um, that puts the right to keep and bear arms right at the top of the amendment. That's not the version that survived. But gun rights people will point to that version and say, well, obviously the intent was the individual right. That didn't survive, and in fact, in the next version, the role of the militia is put at the beginning of the amendment as opposed to the individual right to keep and bear arms. So there's endless discussion that's been going on for centuries amongst constitutional scholars and po politicians about what does it really mean? What is a militia? What is the right to keep and bear arms? Is this a right that was always there from the beginning that we inherited from English common law? Or is the Second Amendment actually established this right to begin with? What are arms? Colonial days, arms were muskets and blunderbusses and probably, and certainly not handguns, and certainly not um, semi-automatic rifles. Uh, what does it mean to keep? Well, keep probably means own, but what does it mean to bear arms? In public? Just on your own private property, in your house, in your car? No, not in your car. Um, so bearing arms wasn't clear. Again, the commas came and went. And you can, you can spend hours parsing the Second Amendment, and putting the commas in and out, and you get very different meanings. But over the years, again, these are constitutional scholars, criminologists, historians, have come to three different interpretations of the Second Amendment. One is that it <clears throat> um, claims an individual right to own arms. Any individual has this right to keep and bear arms. The second is more of the militia interpretation that it's a collective right, that you can keep and bear arms if you're in whatever you interpret a militia to be. And then a third interpretation kind of splits the difference and says, well, there's a civic uh, purpose for keeping and bearing arms, and that is if you're using it for public safety, for the protection of the country, you can keep and bear arms, and then as an individual, you have a right to use them. So that kind of splits the difference. But this controversy between individual and collective rights to keep and bear arms has persisted to, the, to today. Now, once the Second Amendment was ratified, or once the Bill of Rights was ratified, um, you can follow the whole question of gun rights for the next 200 years, and most of the action took place in the states. Federal government had very little to say about uh, gun laws, no Supreme Court decisions until very recently. So most of the action took place in the states, where the states had their constitutions, they had their bills of rights, they had their courts, they had their legislatures, and every state had different laws, different interpretations of the Second Amendment. And again, you see how history complicates the gun debate so, um, so profoundly. Here is most of the significant federal legislation since the time the Second Amendment was ratified. 1934, the National Firearms Act. That was in response to gangland wars, and it more or less, not entirely, but more or less prohibited the use of machine guns. Turns out that you can still buy a machine gun today. It's, hi it's highly regulated, and you have to pass certain tests, but you can actually <clears throat> buy the national Firearms Act, you can still buy a machine gun. 1968, in response to the murders of uh, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, the Gun Control Act. And that established the system of federal firearm licensees. So these are gun dealers who are licensed to sell guns, the FFLs. 1993, in response to the attempted assassination of Ro uh, Ronald Reagan, the Brady Act was passed. And that set up the entire system of background checks for the national, uh, yeah, national instantaneous criminal background check system, NICS. And then in 1994, under Bill Clinton, uh, the assault weapons ban was passed. Uh, and that had a few problems. First, it only had a 10-year duration. It sunsetted in 2004. 
nobody even tried to extend it. Um, how are we doing on time? Four? Okay. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I said that incorporation of the Second Amendment didn't happen until very recently, and that happened in two landmark decisions, and I'd love to spend time going through these because it's absolutely fascinating reading. But <clears throat> the first, the D District of Columbia versus Heller, said that the Second Amendment applies to the District of Columbia. Two years later, McDonald versus City of Chicago, the Second Amendment applies to all states. So finally, here's the statement that states cannot violate the Second Amendment. Unfortunately, these Supreme Court decisions, which are absolutely fascinating reading, were very vague, very eloquent, but very vague about what exact rights are preserved. And even Justice Scalia, who wrote the majority opinion, said, these decisions do not guarantee the right of anybody to carry any gun anywhere. Okay, so what do we do today about gun violence? I'm going to quickly suggest a few uh, approaches. First, it's really important to understand where and how gun violence occurs. 63, two-thirds of the gun deaths in this country are due to suicides. The rest are due to homicides. And of the homicides, almost half are non-felony homicides. And I interpret that to mean arguments, family disputes, uh, acts of passion. Um, there's, there are some felony uh, gun deaths, a lot of them are unknown, very few accidents, and most importantly, the mass shootings that attract all of the media attention are absolutely insignificant. Don't let me say this wrong in terms of numbers. They're absolutely significant, but in the big picture of where gun violence is occurring, it's not occurring in mass shootings. I think one of the most upsetting things to me is the fact that one <clears throat> widely supported solution, or at least to um, eradicating gun violence, is universal or extended background checks. Right now, 40% of gun sales do not go through any background check at all. A significant majority of NRA members, an even larger majority of gun owners, and almost 90% of Americans support extended or universal background checks. Why isn't it happening? These bills have been defeated repeatedly at the federal level and at the state level. So my question is, where is representative government? And my fear is that, in fact, what we're seeing is an erosion of the democracy and you can explain it in a lot of different ways, but I think a big part of it is the role of money in politics. Um, research, right now, is almost non-existent. There's no federal funding for research due to a 1996 amendment by um, Jay Dickey, a representative from Arkansas. We should be looking at gun violence as a public health crisis and take a lesson from the automobile industry where automobile deaths have gone down significantly because we've done research, we've improved the safety of automobiles, but there's no appetite for doing that right now with respect to the gun industry. Ironically, Jay Dickey, who passed this amendment just recently, has said, well, I made a mistake. It's not what I intended. I didn't want to cut off research. Another interesting um, alternative are what's called gun violence restraining orders or extreme risk protection orders, red flag laws, and this is where certain people related to individuals at risk can report that individual and get a court ordered a restraining order to temporarily confiscate guns. This has gotten traction in, well, it's, these restraining orders exist in five states. They're proposed in 19 states, not in Colorado. But this seems like it could be uh, a promising alternative. And just to keep your eye on one thing, Right now, as you probably know, there's a bill in the Senate that looks promising to fix the background check system. Um, there's a really significant bill in Florida right now, and Gover Governor Scott might be signing it at this moment. But at the same time all of these gun control bills are going through, the House has already passed a bill for what's called universal concealed carry. And this means that every state would have to recognize the concealed carry permits in every other state. Some states are very lenient and have no concealed carry requirements. Other states are very strict. But this bill, if passed, and it has passed the House, it's going to the Senate, would um, require everybody to abide by the 
least restrictive requirements. So keep an eye on that one. If this one passes and if this gets through the Senate, then I think it says money is still very involved in politics and uh, we still have a long ways to go. And I think it's time to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>